Good evening, my name is Mary Schutze-Weissman and I'm Programme Coordinator for the Culture of Prosperity at the Legatum Institute. We're very lucky to have Catherine Schenk here with us today. She is the Professor of International Economic History at the University of Glasgow. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and we have a few questions for you on cities today. Um, which city in history for you has been most central to human flourishing? Well, it's a huge, a huge uh, <laughs> group to choose from, obviously. Um, I think I'd probably opt for Constantinople, Istanbul, um, because it is sort of a crossing over of cultures, a mixture of faiths. It was always a, historically over such a long period, um, the inter kind of interconnection between Asia and Europe um, and a place of um, economic exchange, cultural exchange, um, so, and I think it still has that kind of resonance, um, particularly today when there's all these issues about what is Europe um, and what is Asia um, and uh, how people form those kinds of identities. So I think it's obviously still quite central um, to issues today as it was back when it was Constantinople. Great, thank you. Um, and for you, which cities had the, the biggest impact on your life? Um, this is also a tricky one, and I'm going to I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh, I think okay. on this one, um, uh, I'm Canadian, as you might be able to tell from my accent. Um, and my mother's family arrived in the United States in the 1630s, uh, before it was the United States, and they founded uh, three towns um, in Connecticut and Vermont: uh, Stratford, Connecticut, uh, Windsor, Connecticut, and Arlington, Vermont. And if they hadn't gone out there and been so adventurous <laughs> uh, and pioneers in the 17th century, uh, the path of my history would have been extraordinarily different. You know that all the way back from the 17th century. Indeed, it was quite a sort of a famous group of people that, uh, that wow. went out there, Congregationalists. Um, and they ended up uh, loyal to the crown during the American Revolution and got kicked off their land, unfortunately. And that's how we and my family ended up in Canada. Ah, in the 18th okay. Century. I see. So positive, and then the downfall. Mm. <laughs> the strong side. It's over. Um, and which city for you is one to watch for the future? I think the process of urbanisation that um, a lot of countries are undergoing at the moment uh, means that uh, the sort of the nature of cities will change, and the geographical distribution of uh, cities will change. Um, I would kind of look if you're looking out beyond twenty years, maybe to uh, countries where the population is relatively young, relatively mobile and kind of dynamic. Um, so for those, I'd be looking for maybe cities in Africa or maybe even cities in the Middle East um, to be, if you were kind of being more speculative, yeah. uh, to maybe be being creating a new kind of cities in this new kind of technological um, environment that cities are growing in. And of course, that urbanisation is something that happened to Hong Kong as well, which is what we come to next, because your lecture will be on Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, and why does the history of Hong Kong matter to us today? Um, it does seem like a sort of a very small little rock off the, off the coast of China. Um, but it has a really important uh, resonance, I think, with how we understand markets, how we understand free markets, how we see international economic relations um, operate. Um, it's always held up as being a great laissez-faire paradise, the kind of quintessential free market. It's always ranked top in terms of uh, the freest market in the world, um, right back to the 1990s, right back to the 1970s. Um, but as an economic historian, I wanted to look a little bit more deeply at that. And I think understanding the complexities of what that means in terms of a free market, how uh, how a free market isn't all about individual choice, that there are other kind of pressures at play about the relationship between the state and business is much more complicated uh, right. than uh, somebody like Milton Friedman uh, might have suggested back in the 1980s. So if we're, I think it's important to look at Hong Kong as the benchmark or the paradigm of a free market um, and then unpick what that means for what, how we understand capitalism. And how far do you think that the kind of label of a free market paradise has been applied to Hong Kong because there was some kind of confluence of moment and mechanism. You know, it was a small outcrop and it, it, it experienced enormous growth in a very short space of time. But 
how far would that did was the specifics of the moment allow it to do that? Um, I think uh, I think obviously the founding of Hong Kong coming out of uh, the trade between China and the West um, yeah. and the desire for the British uh, to have a free port, if you like, and to not have the constraints of uh, operating in Canton. So it's very founding and it's raison d'etre uh, had to do with um, international trade and opening up markets. Um, and the Hong Kong government, all the way through the period, has sort of protected that sort of idea of what it, what it is. Um, but again, if you look at more closely at how the government uh, is influenced by the businesses that operate there, how constrained some of the markets are, particularly the banking system historically, um, it doesn't look as free as it does on the outside. Well, thank you very much. That's fascinating. I look forward to your lecture this evening. Thank you.